that you know we don't give any credence to the body, and then in the next breath we say, right. well, the bodies are are here, and, and we're examining yeah. relationships and all that, and, which uh, the bodies. Mm -hmm. And I guess what the way I the way I had to come to see it was that yes, in the back of my mind I have to remember that bodies are not real, but it sure seems that that's what I see. In my experience, it seems like bodies are very real. And in my experience is that I, I feel like I'm in relationships with people and I experience a lot of what this is talking about. And so what that means is I still haven't gotten to the fact of that bodies aren't real. I still am, am acting as if there are bodies. And the only reason for that is that, again, you know, the Course talks about we have to start from where we believe we are. I still obviously believe in bodies. I take care of this one as if it was my own. <laughs> you know? And, and, and I, I recognize other bodies as people that I know or people I don't know and things like that. So even though I have a sense that, that, you know, I mean, a, a growing sense that this isn't the way it really is, it sure still seems to be that way. And so that's why there's all this attention and focus given to something that we ultimately say isn't really real. Because we have to start with what we believe. We still haven't gotten down to that, you know, when we talk about tracing back all the beliefs, we still haven't gotten to the belief of bodies. You know, there, there's an underlying assumption in all of this, and that's that, that a belief in bodies. And, and so it's like until we can get to that belief, which is way, way, way at the bottom of all this pile of beliefs that we have, then we still have to start from, you know, like if we talk about the transparencies that are all piled up, bodies are probably, they're probably the bottom transparency. It's time and space. Time and space. And then bodies. World, bodies. So well, they're right there. Close, close, to, close to the so, glass. So it's like, I have to start up here with these top transparencies and start taking those off before I get way down to this one that deals with bodies. So that's why sometimes it seems inconsistent mm -hmm. to say, well, there aren't really bodies, but we're going to talk as if there are. Well, I have a question that I've been wondering about. When you finally get down to the body's transparency, are you going to quit taking care of the ones that seems to be yours? Well, you know, I, I, when I get down to that uh, one... Don't yeah. even try to see yeah. you're the student. Yeah. You're, you're right. doing a lot of talking here, but okay. you have a lot of things to question because right. that's why this is that kindergarten. I mean, mm -hmm. if you guys want to follow me around and really go into this very, very deeply and devote your lives to it, I'll guarantee you that there'll be shifts and there'll be changes and you won't take care of, you know, how Jesus said to his disciples, take no care for what you wear or what you eat, you know, just trust, just go out and, and speak the word and, and all will be provided. And that's been my experience. Again, the, the difference is, is that instead of a personal eye, a private eye, thinking that, that I have to take care of all those things, I really have to, you know, do a lot of work to maintain the body. And all of the things that seem to go into it, you know, feeding it, clothing it, sheltering it, buying health insurance for it, getting it proper medical attention, eating right, um, exercising right and everything, that's not my experience of this world anymore. I don't have that experience. Now, it's, what I see is it's just like, it's like this giant synchronicity that everything is, is taken care of. It's kind of like the night when we went to pick up Mary. And we were, I was telling the story here of picking up the Hitchhiker Randy, and I know Beck was saying, it was getting time to go, you know, and she got up, she got over by the door, and I said, well, we'll just finish the story, and we, after the story was told, it came to its completion, you know, we got in the car, Becca didn't race, <laughs> or, or hit it and go 70 miles an hour, she just went, we obeyed the traffic lights, we got down there, we got out of the car, the bus it just pulled in, it was deloading, and by the time we got to the entrance where Mary was coming through, we both kind of just met. I had just we were not there two seconds or three seconds.
seconds too soon or too late. It was perfect synchronicity. That's you hear that term synchronicity come up a lot because when you get so detached from the mind, it's like life from just seems to be detached from the body. Or the wrong mind. Is wrong. what I meant. Okay. When you get detached from the wrong mind, you're in the right mind. Then it's like you're watching a play in which everything is synchronized, in which you don't have to struggle anymore. You know, to really work hard to make the pieces fit just right. You start to step back and you start to just say, well, I don't have to work on the screen anymore. Everything will be provided. And it's really effortless. You don't have to give any attention to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I hear you yeah. saying. Oh, you don't give attention to food. I mean, obviously, my gosh, food. It's just we've had, had enough <laughs> food here to choke a horse. Right? And it was no different in Adrian. <laughs> we were just down there. And when I've traveled at times where we haven't had a lot for a long time. It's just, you don't take thought for it. It seems crazy to, I mean, I came to a point even with like, um, things like bank accounts and checking accounts. Symbolically, it moved more and more to a, I said, okay, Holy Spirit, it's your, it's your account now, and I even got to the point where I wasn't balancing the checkbook. You know, I had one of these things that automatically was hooked up to the savings, and, and I went months and months and months and months, never bothered to balance the checkbook, no problems, you know, usually that could be a sign of big problems, you don't balance your checkbook, but it was like this sense, even with the money, everything was just synchronized. Exercise, I used to exercise, I used to play tennis, I was concerned about my cardiovascular (laughs) thing, basketball, I used to run, I ran in a 10 kilometer race, and you know, (coughs) I used to go to to food supermarkets and really read the packages like they told me to, you know, fat content, sodium content, calories, cholesterol. Take no thought <coughs> for what you wear or eat. I used to go to the dentist. There was a time I used to go to doctors. There was a time I used to work and really think about when the end of the day was going to come so I could, like Fred Flintstone, go, yabba dabba do. <laughs> you know? There was a time when Friday at 5 o'clock used yeah. to be important. Yeah. There was a time when, when Monday at 8, 8 in the morning used to be a significant on and on and on, what I'm saying is there, if you follow this in, there's a detachment that comes where it still seems on the screen like things are, are clicking in and being taken care of, but you take no thought for it. Your, your whole attention is just riveted on staying with the Holy Spirit and, and sharing His Word and sharing the good news of the Gospel, so to speak. And really, I'm just teaching myself. So it's not like I'm trying to go out even and evangelize. I don't even have a pressure to feel like i got to reach more people, or like I've got this long mission in front of me that's incomplete. I mean, to me, it's a state of completion. I feel very, very total and complete, like, like there's nothing out of place. So, again, what we're doing here is, again, we're going to, Jesus will even describe in the next section, you know, some of the translation that takes place, but really, each time we come together, that's why it's so precious, because what we do is we're really still looking at the symbols that the mind still believes in. So I use, I mean, I'll talk about this higher metaphysics, but I'll use, I'll talk about bodies and, and different things that seem to be the everyday experience, because that's where you have to start. Okay. But again, one of the things, too, is that, um, getting back to Linda's question about the body, is that I, I understand that we're trying to get back to the, to the mind, but, you know, all through the course, it's, it's basically that the body is a learning device, mm-hmm. you know, and that's why you have it. So it's not completely unimportant, and it's for the Holy Spirit's use. And, again, learning device, again, comes back to what are we learning? We're learning to expand perception or to come to heal perception. And for me, the ego would have it be a learning device for our developing skills <laughs> and drawing attention to oneself, and on and on and on. So again, you have to be real clear then on on the purpose. If it's just a learning device, and there's only two lessons in the mind, the right mind and the wrong mind, the whole point of the body is to come to learn right-mindedness. Mm-hmm. At which point, the Course says, you will realize that you have no need of a body at all. In other words, when you learn what you need to learn with your learning device, holy relationship, true perception, the real world, then you have no need for a learning device anymore. At that point, it does become totally meaningless. And then, and useless. so what happens? Wake up, time, <laughs> wake up, abstract knowledge, total joy and love beyond anything that's conceivable. There has nothing to do with the He body. says if you multiply it by a hundred, your faintest glimmering of love by a hundred, and multiply it by a thousand times more than that, you still only have a faint glimmering of what that state is. You know, interesting that we've gotten off on bodies because in this paragraph here on the choice for completion, bodies are never mentioned. Holy Spirit 
it gets into a lot of deep stuff about specialness here, about mm -hmm. trying to trade itself <coughs> and everything, and, and I want to just keep moving on towards that uh, transformation that's coming more and more. Maybe we could just, a summarizing paragraph of this stuff, um, a couple lines. At the top of page 319, it, it kind of summarizes what we've been talking about, about the attraction of guilt, how as long as some things in the world seem valuable, then the mind is really actually attracted to guilt, not seeing that that's what it's attracted to. It doesn't believe that guilt is hell. <laughs> it thinks, thinks that guilt looks pretty attractive. Yeah. Is that where you're starting? Yes, the appeal of okay. hell. Okay, what paragraph is this? The bottom of page 342, paragraph 9. Okay, thanks. The appeal of hell lies only in the terrible attraction of guilt, which the ego holds out to those who place their faith in loneliness. So that kind of describes these gifts. That's what the ego is pulling out, saying, here you go, got a lot of gifts over here for you. And once the mind, once you start to get clearer and clearer, those aren't gifts at all. It's like, I don't want your gifts. <laughs> they aren't really helpful to me. They're just reinforcing this guilt. And it's a paragraph that begins, it's one, two, three paragraphs later, it begins, whenever any form. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 12. Whenever any form of special relationship tempts you to seek for love in ritual, remember love is content and not form of any kind. Now that really lays it out straight because ritual is all these attempts. When you think about, um, if you think even about parent-child relationships or, or romantic relationships or whatever, there's so much ritual that seems to go along with this. So many actions, you know, <coughs> like for example, just take romantic love. Set the mood, candlelight, table for two, bottle of wine, some roses, you know, that's a ritual. <laughs> no doubt about that. That's form. And that's what is raised up is important. It doesn't matter what the two partners say. They can just yeah. be quiet or they can maybe argue and bicker about the food or something. But I mean, it's like the whole set is set the ambiance. Give the night a good start. <laughs> you know, give it some good form. And it really is just raising a ritual of reform as important. And again, where is the content? If the special love relationship is a ritual of form aimed at raising the form to take the place of God at the expense of content. There is no meaning in the form, and there will never be. The special relationship must be recognized for what it is, a senseless ritual in which strength is exacted, extracted from the death of God and invested in his killer as the sign that form has triumphed over content and love has lost its meaning. Would you want this to be possible even apart from its evident impossibility? <laughs> so he's telling you, this is impossible, but would you want it to be possible even apart from the fact that it isn't possible? If it were possible, you would have made yourself helpless. God is not angry. He merely could not let this happen. You cannot change his mind. No ritual that you have set up in which the dance of death delights you can bring death to the eternal. Nor can your chosen substitute for the wholeness of God have any influence at all upon it. And then, maybe one more sentence there. See in the special relationship nothing more than a meaningless attempt to raise other gods before him and by worshiping them to obscure their kindness and his greatness. So it starts to get more and more apparent that anything is really important in terms of form. When we've discussed relationships, you know, it's kind of like, well, what is, what are your interests and what is your partner's interest? Well, we like some of the good things in life. We like fine dining. We have rituals of fine dining. Rituals. We have sexual rituals. We have rituals of travel.